instruction on how to implement these KPIs to the provider setting. Our speakers for this session are Barbara Dempster. She's chair of the HIMSS Patient Identity Integrity Work Group. Uh, Barbara has more than 30 years of senior management experience in healthcare quality, information management, and technology. And our second speaker is Nancy Farrington. Um, Nancy is with the main, mainline health system, and then she she has a, Nancy's career in healthcare spans several decade, decades. She has held positions in the dietary department at Lenox Hill Hospital, in the in the coagulation lab, and medical records department at the University of Mich University of Michigan Hospital. She also serves as the director of the patient access services at Bryn Mawr Hospital, and currently is the MP administrator for Mainline Health in suburban Philadelphia. So thank you very much, Barbara. Good afternoon. This uh, forum was designed and promised some solutions, and I think this session you're going to be pleased because we're going to present a new tool that has been developed uh, by the HIMSS Patient Identity Integrity Work Group for um, patient, uh, patient matching and uh, basically patient identity integrity. The um, objectives, as Mike has stated, is really to provide a tool for standardizing technical and business processes. We're talking about key performance measures which will help administratively, excuse me. The uh, objectives, I think Mike has just gone through those. We want to provide an understanding of uh, how patient identity integrity relates to and impacts on privacy and security, uh, heighten awareness of the key performance indicators, which just went online actually yesterday. Um, it's an important tool for providers and vendors in standardizing the technical and business processes, um, and to provide practical information on how to implement those KPIs in an actual setting. First of all, what we want to do is come up with a definition that we're going to be using of patient identity integrity. Um, we, it's basically the accuracy and quality of data as it relates to an individual and uh, correctness of the linking or matching of all existing records for that individual within and across information systems. When we talk about patient identity integrity, that's kind of, that's the definition that we're using across this whole project. The uh, HEMS journey on patient identity integrity, uh, we, pup, we were approached in 2008 for, uh, uh, by industry to look at the issue of uh, patient identity. We were initially told that there was plenty of standards out there and it really wasn't an issue. So uh, we kept pushing and established the Patient Identity Integrity Work Group, which basically pub well, published a white paper in 2009 identifying nine in key influencers on patient identity. Of those nine, um, and our, it's been interesting to hear the earlier speakers how uh, we are just we're uh, covering a lot of the same turf because we're dealing with the same issues, all from a different perspective. Of those nine key influencers, there were 58 recommendations that came out in that white paper. Of uh, a good portion of those, I'd say about 20% dealt with medical devices and the problems of patient identity th with medical devices that was spun off into a, a totally different work group to pursue those recommendations. And if you'll remember the slide that was Lisa's last slide that showed the privacy and security toolkit, down at the bottom on the left-hand side of the menu was the medical device security section. So if you haven't been to the privacy and security toolkit, Go out there and see that there's a ton of good information that has been developed and honed, honed over the years. How many of you have been on the Privacy and Security Toolkit? Okay, so you, there's a lot of you that have probably uh, visited some of this, but please understand 
that it is a live living document and it's being updated with current information. Of those um, other influencers, there's only three, industry standards, system interfaces, and algorithms that clearly deal with the, the technology. The remaining five uh, are really more the human aspect of the uh, identity integrity process. The uh, patient identity toolkit was then created as a subsection of the privacy and security toolkit to address those 58 recommendations minus the medical device. Those recommendations uh, turned around security safeguards, model interface protocols, key performance indicators, model monitoring reports, executive training, and a thirst to have one central location for all the literature that's out there on patient identity. Because up to that point, everything was scattered. You had to hunt and look for things that, uh, talking, networking, do you have anything related to? A lot of time, it would be buried in a, uh, a trade association journal that other uh, parts of the elephant didn't have access to. So, uh, and then an, a separate section on the implications of HIE on patient identity. So this patient identity integrity toolkit has been out there. The, la the last and latest edition uh, is the key performance indicators because that became really the biggest problem to, uh, uh, it was just a, uh, a hard ball to unravel. Um, I wanted to talk about why privacy and security, uh, patient identity integrity is a function of privacy and security because it impacts the quality of care, uh, patient safety and medical errors, patient privacy, medical identity theft, cost of identity errors. All of those things are, uh, can be outcomes of bad patient identity data. And of course, the Im impending impact of HIEs and NUHIN uh, create enormous uh, challenges for the industry. And overall, there seems to be a lack of understanding in what the implications are for patient identity, identity as a total business process within and across the organization. Um, the major operational impact areas are the clinical operations clearly, uh, the quality of care that can be impacted. Your technology is seriously involved from the provider, provider setting IT department to the vendor and software development. And you have all the competitive uh, black box solutions out there. Then health information management, which is frequently the area that is uh, challenged with resolving all the uh, the duplicates that come in from the misidentifications, and clearly the financial bottom line is hit. Um, fr from a clinical standpoint, if you have missing clinical documentation, you can have duplications of service simply because they didn't find uh, the, inf the information if there was a false negative uh, match. They didn't find a test that was done, so they do the test again. That provide the provider and patient time involved in that and uh, the dissatisfaction of uh, that uh, inconvenience, so to speak. And then the lack of a longitudinal record is clearly, uh, we've t talked about that really in previous sessions. Um, clinical documentation on the wrong person, the overlay where uh, the one patient's uh, information is overlaid on another patient, probably of a very similar name or identical name. And so the um, patient who had the appendectomy uh, six years ago shows up on the record of the guy who's presenting in the emergency with all the signs of appendicitis. So we can see that the clinical implications of an overlay can be serious in terms of patient care and patient safety. 
Um, clearly, the direct cost of making corrections in the mitigation and litigation, that can be applied to all of the um, operational sec uh, domains. From a technology standpoint, uh, when you have poor matching data, you get replication and proliferation of your problems throughout your system. And of course, the uh, coming of the HIE is uh, just a, a dark cloud facing us. Um, and also touched on in um, the early, uh, by I guess Lisa in the last session, limited deployment of enhanced technology at the front end has uh, provided some of the issues that are, are challenges. Uh, algorithms vary from product to product, from system to system. Some are very rudimentary, some are very sophisticated, and they come out with different uh, results. So uh, they can't, uh, there is no one solution. That is one thing that you really need to keep in mind, that all of those nine drivers have to be addressed at some level. And um, again, smart cards, biometrics, Lisa had indicated in the survey that they're just not in use in the healthcare sector at this point. Um, in the health information management industry estimates anywhere from 8 to 12 percent of a hospital's records are duplicates. Um, and if your organization has merged with other facilities, it can go as high as over 20 percent, and I have seen them at 40 percent. Um, if it's if eight percent of them, if you've got a hundred thousand in, in your database, eight thousand patients are affected. If you've got a, a million in your database, eighty thousand patients. So eight percent um, it may sound not too bad, but it really is when you start talking about the actual people affected. And Chime did a survey in May of this year where 47% of the respondents said that they had had a false negative matching rate of 8% or above. And the false negative, again, is when the, 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 the second record on the same patient, same individual, is not found and linked to the other. So you've, you've, there's a disconnect there, and you're missing some information. 41% 40, of the respondents indicated experiencing false positive matching rates of 8% and above, and that's the overlay of the uh, one patient's record on another. Uh, financial costs, the administrative costs for making corrections and maintaining the infrastructure for bad data, it is actually cheaper to maintain a clean database because then you don't have to build the infrastructure for everybody to fix it when things go wrong. Um, again, the cost implications for regulatory noncompliance, risk management, and the legal liabilities involved, and of course clinical projects and things of that uh, are uh, cost factors. The problem of patient identity integrity is a cross-organizational and a multi-stakeholder uh, event. Um, as the CIO, CISO, you carry, you reach into every corner of the institution as uh, keepers of the data, and you have to understand and identify where the problem areas are, and then those need to be, there needs to be constant monitoring because this is a living uh, organism People are coming and going. There's constant changes, uh, any kind of change management in your systems. Data capture is critical. If you're in a particularly large organization, you've got people in one area that are collecting information differently from people in another area. Your system compatibility, too, becomes an issue. Uh, simple completed fields can be a, 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 a very critical of that one data element that might help you find a match in your database. Uh, format requirements, system interfaces, corrective actions, these are all the things, the, the, the business processes that have to be addressed in, in order to have some level of um, governance over your, your data. 
So the, the governance imperative is, first of all, and this was mentioned, I think, by Tim in the very first section in, on security in general, and there has to be that organizational commitment to accurate patient identity um, with explicit guidelines for data governance and stewardship, the quantifiable expectations and performance standards, and the key performance uh, measures that we're going to uh, be presenting provide you those performance standards and measuring capability. Internal assessment and controls establish internal metrics. These are your key performance indicators. Perform baseline and continuous assessments and then obviously the feedback loop within the organization must be part of that whole uh, governance plan. The um, tool that we are providing, the key performance indicators, uh, provide a basis for your performance reviews, appropriate compensation, recognition for personnel, and the list can go on. There, it's, it's a wonderful uh, tool to have in terms of administering and managing your patient identity process. And it provides tools to assess vendor performance uh, and vendor transparency. There is a problem with identity management with vendors in terms of the black box. We don't know what the effectiveness is. We have to depend. They tell us what their uh, matching rate is, uh, for our accuracy rate is. But because it's proprietary within their black box, there's no way for us to really, really know but we need to start demanding from the vendors the capabilities to provide these measures so that we can um, assess our processes within our own organizations. The um, key performance indicators, again, are in the Patient Identity Integrity Toolkit, and you just saw in Lisa's last slide as a section of the Privacy and Security Toolkit on the HIMSS.org website. There's actually two documents included. The, there are, we identified 14 key data measures, and that's the, 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 uh, the, the, the count, so to speak, of how many the incidents of something occurring. And then we uh, took those measures and turned them into nine key performance indicators with uh, examples of how they would be used. And there's also, we identify the major audiences for those, um, for those PKIs and um, KPIs. Is that what I, I always do at PK, I've said PKI too long. It's hard to get KPI out. But we've also identified a section in the document that, that says what um, KPIs, the C-suite upper management decision and policy makers should have mastery over. And then the next one we talk about what, uh, which ones department heads, supervisors, quality assurance monitors, practice managers, and other middle management compliance monitors should have mastery over. And then we also talk about frontline supervisors and staff. And then we also have a section on health information exchanges. And then the, the last section is for vendors and developers of MPI software and what they, uh, what they need to master in terms of uh, assisting developing systems for our organizations where we can have good measurement data on our uh, activities. There is a second document that we did. It's just a three-page uh, piece on uh, providing scenarios. And the scenarios basically are um, acute rural hospitals. Uh, and let's see. The, the rural critical access hospitals, community hospitals, and university academic IDNs. So there's a, a scenario for each of those settings because you may use the same measure, but your numbers may vary because depending on what your patient population is, the size of your database, um, there, there's, you have to use your 
your own evaluation ability. And at this point, I think Nancy's going to come up and tell, give you some practical uh, exposure to the key performance indicators. Good afternoon. Well, good afternoon. Maybe I need to move this away from my mouth a little bit. Um, I wanted to start, I've never spoken before a group like this before, so I'm kind of curious and thought I would start out by asking you some questions about uh, what's going on in your organizations. And um, so, what percentage of this audience is our CIOs how many CIOs? Okay. And then other people in information technology? The majority. What about people in other roles in the healthcare environment? Okay, so we've got a good, pretty good mix out here. How many of you have um, patient integrity, patient ID integrity monitoring programs in place? Not too many, at least. Not that are raising their hands. Um, and for those of you that don't know whether or not you have a monitoring program in place, do you have any sense of what the duplicate rate is in your organization? No response, so I have to assume the answer is no. I was going to ask who's is 3% or less, but since nobody's monitoring it, I guess we don't know the answer to that one. Um, The next series of questions I had was all related to that as well. <laughs> so I was going to ask who's responsible for your monitoring program, whether it was IT, HIM, patient access, or some other arm of the organization. That is a possibility in various organizations. It's one or the other of those groups or a combination of all three. From a survey that Nahum did several years ago now, the hospitals with the best results were those that had um, the work done by people from all three of those disciplines. I, as one individual, represent all three. My healthcare, my more recent healthcare career, um, started with uh, patient access management. At, that was my Bryn Mawr Hospital role. From there, when we implemented our EMPI, I moved into my, that role of EMPI administrator being moved to IT. And then about four years ago, my role moved into HIM. So I embody all those various roles in one person. The other thing that's an important consideration as you implement a um, patient identity integrity program is determination about how often you're going to work your reports. So, oh, these are, this is an example of two, I'm sorry. This is an example of two of our uh, formulas, which I'll talk a little bit more about as we move through. The, probably the two most significant ones that I think you need to be interested in uh, is your overall duplicate rate, which is a pretty easy number to gather, and then um, the false positive rates. The reason the false positive rates are so important is because those are the numbers that lead to, or the, the uh, un matches that are not really matches that have a strong potential to lead to overlays, which is about the riskiest piece of patient identification. Um, okay, these slides are different than the ones I had. Sorry about that. Um, so, the, um, oh, I can look here. The, there, are, there are, as Barbara mentioned, there are 14, or there are nine KPIs in the toolkit. And which one of those you, which one of them you use is probably dependent on the maturity of the program in your organization 
and as well as the resources that you have available to work the process, both technology resources and human resources. Some of the um, KPIs in the toolkit include the database size, what's the po population of people in the database, the um, additions, the number of new records that get added on a regular basis, whatever interval you're measuring it. In, in my organization, I measure that weekly. The number, of the number of duplicates in the database, as well as the duplicate rate. So the number of records in the database, um, or the number of duplicates divided by the number of records in the du database. And then another one, the duplicate creation rate. The duplicate creation rate is also a little bit more challenging to, to um, determine because it's dependent on the ability of your systems to be able to identify the denominator. What every encounter, every time somebody has the ability to create a new record, as if the patient had never been there before, has the potential to create a duplicate. So if you can truly collect those numbers, then you um, can, get a, can, can get a good rate estimate here. Sometimes, especially in practice management systems, that number is very hard to determine because they don't create a new episode necessarily for every care encounter or every scheduling encounter. On the hospital side, it's a little bit easier to determine because you can pretty, e pretty easily determine the total number of registrations and use that as the denominator. My database has both in it, so it gets a little challenging trying to determine the rate for us. And then the false positive rate, as I mentioned earlier, is the real danger because that's what um, has the ability or what tends to lead to overlays. The algorithms that are used in the algorithms that are oh, God, back up a minute. The algorithms that are used in um, creating duplicate reports or potential duplicate reports are basically the same algorithms that are used in presenting matches to the registration staff. So uh, if you're getting a lot of false positives on your report, the probability is that the staff doing the registration are getting those same false positives and have the, are almost encouraged by the system to select the wrong person or select a person that's not their patient um, based on the numbers assigned in the algorithm. It's, it's pretty eye-opening experience doing the work that I do because there are coincidences that happen on a routine basis that I would never have expected to happen. Within the past month, we had a situation in one of our hospitals, patient presented for service, same, and within two hours, same pa a patient with the same name and same date of birth presented at another hospital down the road, two, six miles down the road from the first one. Patient at hospital, the first hospital, left there because the wait was too long in the ER. They came on down the road to the second hospital their records got messed together. Now, ultimately, the registration staff knew something was wrong, so they created brand new records for both of them, far less risky than continuing to use one record for two different people. But it did take a little while to get it straightened out. Okay, now I'll move forward. Um, so we're talking about critical access hospitals or and what this, this is one of the examples out of the toolkit that Barbara mentioned and um, in, in our scenario creation. And it is, um, we, we thought we needed to speak specifically about the rural critical access small hospitals. Even though, is there anybody in the room from a small hospital? No, and I truly did not expect that there would be, but we tend to forget about them. 
because those of us that participate in tech, most highly in technology, those of us that participate most often in professional activities and conferences are from larger organizations typically. However, rural hospitals, small community hospitals serve a very large number of patients throughout the country. So we always have to keep them in mind as we look at things and uh, develop tools for people to use for this kind of activity. I was just very recently reminded of that, uh, talking to a colleague of mine who happens to be a close personal friend as well, and um, she was talking about the benefits of using a sophisticated matching algorithm. She works for a um, national healthcare chain in, in patient access and very few of their hospitals, I did not solicit this information, she started chatting about it. Uh, very few of their hospitals use a sophisticated matching algorithms. Most of them use a phonetic inquiry. Some of them strictly use deterministic exact match inquiries to select their patients at the point of registration. Those that use sophisticated matching have, I think she said, a, ten, uh, a tenfold better outcome with lower med duplicate medical records. Those without the sophisticated matching have 10 times as many duplicates as those that do. So um, that is kind of important to be aware of. Tools are very important. The, um, the example that we created, we made up these hospitals for critical access hospital is one that has 250,000 records in their database and we estimated that they had a 5% duplicate rate. And that probably when in a hospital environment like this, when they say what their duplicate rate is, it's probably really significantly higher because they don't really know what the rate is, it's hidden. Um, duplicate prevention historically has been based on people's contacts with each other in the community. So we made up a, a, a woman who's lived in the community her whole life and every day she goes through at the end of the day and she looks at all the new records that were created and she searches the database again because she might know, oh, well, Nancy is really Anne. Her, name, her legal name is really Ann, and therefore I know I can find her. Or, gee, I know that Mary was at this hospital before. Why didn't they find her this time? Oh, that's right. She got married or she got divorced. That, that, that's the kind of challenge that you have when you are um, using strict matching as the criteria for selecting patients from the database. In a small community hospital, there may be some advantage in that people know each other and can make those judgments about each other, but obviously that's not the most desired outcome. And as that organization would move towards an, um, an electronic record and start implementing the use of um, sophisticated matching, several things are gonna happen. One is they're gonna find out their rate is a lot higher, the other thing that's going to happen is this woman that's been doing all this work all along is going to need a whole new set of skills that she hasn't had. So training or else we're going to force her to retire, which sometimes happens. Um, and, um, and when they, if they start joining an HIE or a nationwide health information exchange, it's got a lot of implications in terms of what their data quality is like. Oh, and uh, although that may not be as much of an issue as, as uh, I tend to think because there's still a huge disparity and in fact, apparently the disparity, according to Information Week um, of EMR and HI Im implementation in small hospitals versus large is growing, not decreasing despite the government efforts in the other direction. Okay, so our next scenario is a community hospital. This hospital has a database size of 500,000 records and a 20% duplicate rate in the database. 
So immediately we know something is wrong, but we don't know what's wrong. In order to determine what's wrong with this, we need to find out the, crea the duplicate creation rate. If the duplicate creation rate is high, that means that we've got a lot of problems on the front end that we need to attend to. We may be that we haven't historically used a sophisticated matching algorithm. We've just used some sort of deterministic process. Um, it might be that we lack the governance issues that we need, the standards, either and it was very interesting to hear our earlier speakers talk about, they may be written on paper, but they may not, we may not really be following those policies and procedures. I find that to be a very common problem. Sure, this is what I'm supposed to do, but it's not what um, people actually do. And um, there may be other tools that they need on the front end to avoid that creation. If we find that, in fact, the duplicate creation rate is relatively low, 2% less, something like that, and if we are really accurately calculating the number of opportunities to create a duplicate, those encounters that I spoke of earlier, 2% creation rate would be low, but it still would be substantial. What do we need to do to prevent them? There are, we need to establish standards. There are governance standards and there are software-driven standards. The governance standards are the policies and procedures. What, f what requirements do you have before you will add a person to your database? Even if the software allows you to add a patient to the database with three or four data elements such as name, date of birth, and gender, are you as an organization going to permit that? My recommendation would be no, because that's not enough information to make a good match as to whether or not that person matches another patient or somebody that's already in your database. So every time you add a record like that and don't complete collection of data on that patient, that's a risk. Um, then there are software-driven ones. So using tools, algorithms, that will enable you to, um, to do a better job at data collection. When you collect an address, there are, there are tools that you can use to see if that address is valid. Um, there are, and in fact, you can use some of these tools on the front end to help you determine people's propensity to pay. That doesn't impact patient identification, obviously, but gives you a lot of information in terms of um, ab about the patient. The other things are related to education, the education of the staff on the front end. So what are the, they need to understand what the impacts of not doing their job correctly is. They also need to know what the trends are. So where are you having problems? Is it in specific departments? Is it at times a day? Is it the ER? Is it on third shift? That kind of information in terms of trends enables you to focus your corrective actions and thereby avoid continuing the problem. And then technology. We've talked about matching algorithms. It was very interesting to me earlier to see about the biometrics. People are not using them, but they would be an incredibly valuable tool in terms of, um, of, of preventing this kind of problem. I don't understand why we haven't had more penetration. Th things as simple as a photo ID, and when you scan the photo ID, not only just scanning it and leaving it in the file, but then looking back the next time the patient comes in to see if, in fact, it is the person you're registering the second time. Palm scanning has had some penetration in registration. Again, not where it probably could be to help address this problem. And um, iris scanning is very new in the healthcare arena, and I don't, I'm not aware of anybody that's actually implemented it yet, although I'm hopeful in the future we will be singing a different tune there. Um, smart cards have had penetration with remarkable success, very, very rapid return on investment in terms of reduction of um, duplicate rates, 
And um, there is a bill in Congress now which will be resubmitted uh, in, in the new year, the new Congress, to uh, conduct a pilot program with smart cards from Medicare and Medicaid in five pilot sites. So if that goes through at the next conference, we'll be able to report the success stories of that. And then again, the references to the website for the detailed programs. And I think that just some references, you'll get them from your Barbara and Nancy. I was recently a patient at a local hospital and they actually use palm scanning, which I had never seen before. Any comments on that? Yes, several actually. The first thing is that palm scanning is a huge assistance in locating patients that have previously existed in your database. There are two cautionary things, though. The first one is proper enrollment. So to make sure that when we scanned your palm and enrolled you in our database, that we were very careful to make sure that you said you were who you said you were. So what identification do we collect to validate at that time? The other thing, and this is a recent learning for me, is that the way palm scanning works it doesn't enable you to do a search of a large database. So you have to use another piece of information to narrow the potential field of matches in order to locate the patient or else you're gonna end up doing 20 or 30 different kinds of inquiries. So typically people that use it use date of birth and the palm. So it's going for people in your age range before it searches to see if your palm scan already exists. But as opposed to deterministic logic or even sophisticated matching, it's definitely an asset. One more question. How, will, how is you or your organization preparing for the national patient ID or the HPID, the healthcare patient ID, and will that help with the duplicate issue, or will that just be another piece of data then that we have to be matching up along with date of birth and other things? I don't really believe it's gonna happen. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I just, the privacy advocates get terribly up in arms every time we get close to it happening. You can think way back to the Clinton administration when they showed that healthcare ID card. It was part of the original plan and it hasn't happened. And in fact, there still exists in the omnibus reconciliation bills a prohibition from Congress or from the implementation of any um, national patient identifier without the explicit permission of Congress. And what has happened as a result of that, even though the stipulation says they can't implement without it, the attitude has been, there's not even really much work being done to investigate the possibility of it. I do think that it has the, um, that it would dramatically reduce incidental erroneous duplicates. It does have the possibility of also potentially contributing to fraud if it is the only identifier that is used to validate a patient's identity. And I would like to add something on that it, from the terms, of, from the standpoint of the unique, the unique identifier in general. Part of the uh, white paper findings was the prohibition on uh, by Congress on uh, the use of uh, the health identifier by uh, government agencies, basically, the Department of Health and Human Services. And one of the, uh, the activities and recommendations were to establish a, and what happened was HEMS established a coalition of uh, many interest groups, industry, uh, organizations to basically 
uh, lobby Congress in order to get that uh, prohibition lifted because it's silly not to be able to even look at the impact of a unique identifier. And the, um, the RAND study clearly showed that when you use a unique identifier in conjunction with an algorithm, that the unique identifier does, has a major effect on improving the quality of the outcome of the algorithm matches. So as I mentioned earlier, there is no one solution, but uh, if we weave all of these things, uh, these tools together in um, creating our, our best solution for our own organizations, uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge and it's a major challenge, but the, uh, the payoff is huge to your organization. All right, well thank you very much. We have one more session. Barbara and Nancy, great job, thanks. And they'll be...